Good afternoon and welcome to the third in um, the OITE uh, mental health series. Um, the topic today is addictive behaviors and we want to look at this from uh, the perspective of the COVID winter we have coming up, the long sustained uh, quarantine uh, and stress that we've been under. I'm joined today uh, by Marin Rieger, who is a therapist uh, in the uh, Washington DC community at Jonah Green and Associates. She is also an OITE wellness advisor has, and has been helping me think through the impact of addiction and addictive behaviors on trainees now for um, maybe a year or so. Uh, she's gonna give a portion of the talk and then uh, we'll be joined by uh, Nancy Diaz Granados, who is a uh, psychiatrist who works at the NIAAA doing uh, alcohol addiction research. And Marin and Nancy are gonna share uh, the stage today. I just want to remind you that we have programs coming up monthly, usually the first Monday or Tuesday of the month. Uh, each of the past webinars is archived on our YouTube channel, and you can take a look at the suicide prevention webinar and the wellness through a cultural lens webinar um, on our YouTube page. At this point, this webinar will be up there shortly. I also want to remind people of the resilience series that we offer, um, especially because self-advocacy and assertiveness for scientists is coming up uh, next week. These are monthly webinars with follow-up small group discussions for trainees at all levels. While anyone can join us for the webinar, the small group discussions are limited to trainees. Please help spread the word. We did an assessment of the series over the summer and um, our data show quite an impact on students' ability to handle stress uh, and navigate setback in research environments. And so uh, please uh, remember to join us for that. And then finally, one last advertisement, and that is for the many resources on our website around leadership and mentorship and wellness and resilience and supporting trainees, both during the pandemic uh, and in other ways through quality mentorship. And I hope that you will join us in working hard to make the biomedical research community as supportive and as welcoming and as inclusive as it can possibly be. So I think in my many, many years as a uh, mentor to students uh, in my role running programs, some of the hardest conversations I've ever had are around addictive behaviors and the impact of addiction uh, on trainees uh, who desperately want to be successful in the research space and are desperately struggling uh, with um, addiction that's getting in the way. And I realize that um, we uh, have a lot of things that we're not willing to talk about, uh, both at work and beyond, um, but especially thinking about the research space I don't think in my entire time um, in this space, I've been invited to a conversation around supporting people through uh, addictions and, and making sure that the environment is such where we can tackle such hard things. Somebody emailed me and said, it's an act of courage to sign up for the webinar. I think it's an even greater act of courage to show up at the small groups afterward. Um, and I think that we owe ourselves and our community, we owe the people in our families and our friends who struggle with this, um, we owe ourselves a careful look at our own addictive behaviors. And so I wanna thank you for coming today. Um, I am going to turn the floor over to Marin. Please put questions into the question box. Also, if you want to attend the small group and you would like closed captioning, or the ASL interpreter to join the group with you, please go ahead um, and send that in the chat box uh, directly to me, and we'll make sure uh, to set that up. So with that introduction um, and introductory comments, I'm gonna turn the floor over to Marin. Thank you for being here, Marin. Thanks, Sharon, thank you so much. I think this is you know, a more relevant topic than ever um and i'm really glad we're talking about it 
today. So thinking through our first point, sort of why is coping such an important topic now? It's important now because we are living under such intense conditions um, due to COVID and due to the stress related to that. Um, and it's just a really hard time. And I think when it comes to this idea, we sort of know this and we don't know this, right? So logically we can all say, yes, of course we are living through this, pick your adjective time, this really, you know, unprecedented, challenging time. And yet we forget, people say to me all the time, why, you know, why am I drinking more? Why am I eating more? Why are things so hard? And it is, it's because we're going through this. So just uh, remembering to give yourself and your colleagues and your loved ones a little bit of leeway if you can, because what we're going through, I think would give us, take us a long way. Um, next slide. So again, we are not only under a lot of stress because of COVID, but we are then under a particular amount of stress because of the holidays. The holidays are a really stressful time. Um, they can be fun and wonderful, but with that, we have to realistically understand that that brings a lot of extra stress to us. I mean, there's stress related to time with family or of course away from family. Given, given what we're going through right now and the, I mean, the pressure to, to social distance versus not social distance from our family is, is particularly challenging. For those who live alone, um, the holidays are a time where that loneliness can really be amplified. Grief is more pronounced. Um, financial and schedule stress is more pronounced. So if you are struggling with that already, you're much more likely to be struggling with it now. Next slide. So we're here today to talk about the coping and the numbing behaviors that people are using to get through this unique and challenging time. We talk about coping and numbing and they might feel like one of the same sometimes but today we're going to talk a lot about how do you know if you're coping which is sort of the goal and how do you know if you're numbing out which is sort of short term and not as effective so emotional numbing happens when we're under stress right and we're trying to blunt some of the emotional pain protect ourselves so as we feel these extreme emotions extreme anxiety that we're feeling right now it's not unusual to try to find a way to numb out those feelings because they can be too much to bear. And so we're seeing a lot of people struggling with habits that are numbing that aren't as effective long-term. So numbing behavior is what we'll talk about today. You know if you're numbing, if it's short-term, but it doesn't really work long-term. And you'll know if you're coping, if the behaviors that you're using tend to have a greater positive impact in your life. So take a look at some of these sort of habits, coping, numbing mechanisms here. A really good first step in examining how our habits and how our coping mechanisms are impacting our life is really just to be mindful in the first place, right? A lot of us are not particularly even aware. We might have automatic habits that we don't even know we're doing. We might be reaching for the snack cabinet whenever something gets really stressful at work now that we're all working from home and we don't even realize that we're using these things sometimes we're using these habits as a way to get by and they might be serving us well some of us are not serving us well at all so talking about this today i just wanted to put out a whole bunch of different habits that people can use So again, thinking about, you know, the habits, um, the substances that we just named, I try not to think too much in terms of good or bad. And, you know, people ask me in therapy all the time, is this normal? Is this good? Is this bad? And what I say is I don't really know or care if something is normal. I care a lot about how your habits make you feel. So many times escapism habits are healthy in moderation, 
right? They're not necessarily good or bad, but they can become unhealthy depending on how excessively we're using them. So that's why I ask us to be mindful about our habits. I think social media is a really salient example right now of something, uh, a habit we all have that's impacting all of us kind of differently. So on one hand, social media can be this really positive way to connect to people, right? In a time where we need to connect more than ever. And on that end of the spectrum, it can be really healthy and lead to us feeling connected and lead to us feeling happier in the long term. But we can also spend hours and hours sort of, you know, scrolling through, comparing ourselves to other people, reading negative comments. And then on that end, social media can make us feel really bad, can make us feel sad and empty or more alone. And so that's, that's you know, when people ask me how much time is good or bad, again, I say, how does it make you feel? How does it make you feel to go on Facebook? How does it make you feel if you go on Facebook for five minutes versus an hour? when you're, you know, maybe avoiding other things in your life. Pay attention to that and you will get answers about what is right for you versus what is good and what is bad. TV is another example. A lot of people can use TV in a healthy way. It's kind of a neutral habit, right? We know it doesn't benefit us a lot from a health perspective, but watching a show in the evening maybe that you really enjoy when you're done with what you need to do is one thing. Binging for hours as a means maybe to avoid our work, that's usually something that leads people to feel sort of guilty and not so great about themselves. So again, a key point, pay attention to how your habits make you feel. Pay attention to when you engage maybe in habits that don't make you feel so good. You might think, if, my, if a habit doesn't make me feel good, why would I do it? But people engage in habits that don't make them feel good all the time because the brain has powerful ways to make us want to do what we expect it to do over and over. And that's how we get into grooves with habits like overeating or drinking or numbing that we do automatically without even being aware that it really doesn't make us feel that good. And paying attention to that can be a, just, just how does it make you feel and can I do something about it? So again, if you're trying to figure out whether or not a habit you have is, rather than good or bad, is it coping or is it numbing? Coping usually works slower, right? Numbing works quickly, which is oftentimes why it's more addictive. Alcohol works really quickly, right, on our brain. It uh, affects receptors that make us usually feel relaxed and make us feel drift different right away but does it make us feel better in the long term? No, oftentimes it doesn't. It works quickly and powerfully. It doesn't really work effectively. Coping is helping us manage our emotions, work through them, deal with them, deal with the anxiety, deal with the pain. Numbing is avoiding the pain. Numbing is saying, I'm gonna shut down, I'm gonna to go to another place where I don't feel this pain, rather than learn how to cope with the pain or the emotion that we're struggling with. Again, I think oftentimes coping makes us feel good afterward. Numbing makes us feel guilty afterward. I talk to a lot of people who struggle with a cycle, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we move forward, where you know they crave something, crave uh, food or a drink or a drug, give into it, makes you feel better in the short term, and then you feel really guilty. And that's when you're stuck in sort of a cycle. Again, coping oftentimes creates long-term results, numbing, create short-term results. And oftentimes our coping skills give us a sense of control. Control is another important point to key into if you're talking about addictive habits. Do you control your habit or does your habit control you? If you are engaging in a habit that you feel out of control of your ability to start or stop, that's a, that's a good key indicator that you, you might wanna try to do something different. Um, oftentimes there are habits we have in our life that lead to other healthy habits. Um, going for a walk can, you know, make us more inclined to maybe eat a healthy food. And oftentimes numbing behaviors can be, can exist together. So pay attention to where one numbing habit leads to another numbing habit and how they're all intermingled. And then pay attention to your health. How are these habits 
impacting your health. We really are made up of the habits that we have. Every day we all engage in some kind of repetitive habit from what we do when we wake up to what we do when we go to bed. And those, those habits really make us who we are and lead to the life that we have in a lot of important ways. So this is, this is a quote that really struck me when I read it. It's from a researcher named Brene Brown that some of you may know who does a lot of shame and vulnerability research. And it says, we cannot selectively numb emotion. If we numb the dark, we numb the light. So taking the edge off pain and discomfort, we are by default taking the edge off joy, love, belonging, and the other emotions that give meaning to our lives. And I love this when I read it because I hadn't really thought of it that way, that if we numb ourselves, we numb ourselves from pain, but we also numb ourselves from joy and happiness and the sort of emotional highs of life if we are just kind of blunted, right? So there's a cost. There's a cost to numbing. There's, there's a cost to immediate ability to not feel pain. And that is oftentimes that we miss out on joy and other positive emotions. So this is the habit loop that uh, I was referring to a moment ago. It's a common part. Uh, it is um, mentioned in addiction a lot because there's a trigger that makes us think about the habit that we want to engage in. And this can be person, place, a time or situation. So it might be five o'clock. That just reminds you it's time to have a drink. The routine is having the drink, for example. The reward is how it makes you feel in the short term and addictive habits create a stronger connection to an immediate burst of feeling good that leads us wanting more immediately and sometimes feeling guilty and leaving us sort of never being satisfied because we can't get enough to feel that same level of comfort. I think this is where I am going to hand it off to Nancy to talk about specifically about addiction. Uh, hello, everyone. So as it was mentioned, I work on the National Institute of Alcohol uh, Abuse and Alcoholism. Um, I'm going to talk um, briefly about addiction and the neurobiology of addiction, but we don't want to make this much of a kind of science talk. So addiction can be defined as a chronic relapsing brain disorder. And I think for me, the key part here is that it's a brain disorder. There's significant changes to your brain functioning um, when you use um, um, any of these uh, substances or these behaviors in a, a routine manner. Uh, so it's characterized by a compulsion to seek and take drugs, the loss of control, and this is very important over the drug intake, and by a very negative emotional state during withdrawal. Uh, if we can move to the next slide, thank you. And this is actually for me the key part on the neurobiology uh, discussion. Um, allostasis is the process of achieving stability through change. So as uh, Maureen was saying, you know, when you add a behavior to your routine, and this can be anything that you do, it can be drinking, it can be, you know, walking, it can be anything that you do routinely will change your body, will change how you function. So, um, so allostasis is how you achieve stability in uh, when you add something to your usual functioning. So, so for example, if you're adding alcohol, which is my area of research, there is going to be a chronic deviation on how your brain and your body functions um, um, to uh, function normally with alcohol. And we all know it when someone drinks routinely, they develop a tolerance to alcohol. So they can drink much more than most of us could drink, uh, could drink without having the effects that usually you would have when you're drinking every day. And the allostatic load is the cost to the brain for that deviation or to your body. And as I said, you can see this on everything. If you exercise every day, if you spend two hours on the gym, you're going to see a change in your body. You're going to see a change in your functioning. Uh, can we move to the next slide? And, and so what is that load? And specifically with drugs, what is the cost of that change? So um, 
So this is actually a graphic for alcohol, but this applies to almost all drugs and it in, applies to things like gaming addiction or to any addictive behavior. So we're talking about here about the, the disease and how the disease can change your brain. Um, you would constantly try to seek a positive effect. So mood, for example, there will be an initial euphoric effect from the drug or from the alcohol um, that is followed by some kind of difficult or uncomfortable sensation. And as you make this behavior a routine, as you make this behavior something that happens every day in your life, um, these points will change. This, this euphoric effect will be less euphoric every time. And the negative effects of it would be much more prevalent, which means at some point people are really not seeking to have an euphoric effect they're really trying to avoid the negative effects of withdrawal, the negative effects of not having um, that drug or alcohol or gaming or whatever is the behavior. The, the, the withdrawal from that is so negative that um, they are seeking to kind of return to normal, not even to have a euphoric effect, but just trying to return to normal. If we can move to the next slide. And this changes your brain just like going to the gym every day would change your body and actually also your brain in very in very really good ways um, drinking alcohol or using drugs or gaming or some of these numbing behaviors some of them can change your brain in very negative ways and um, and this is when uh, any of these behaviors become an illness when you have some changes in your brain that make it very hard for you to control your drinking. So there's usually an initial, there's kind of different stages. If you look at the, there's stages of addiction, there's a box in the bottom of the slide um, that shows how initially there's an euphoric effect. And, and um, as you continue to drink or use this drug, you're not having the euphoric effect, you're escaping dysphoria, which means you're escaping the negative effects of not having that behavior or that, um, or that drug, and you are actually almost uncomfortable, uncomfortable every time, all the time that you're not drinking. So you lose control. You no longer have any control over your drinking or over your behaviors because you are very, um, you're in a lot of discomfort when this drug or this behavior is not part of your routine and your life. Um, if we can move to the next slide. And I want to talk a little bit about alcohol because alcohol use disorders are really the most common um, problem that uh, that we have in the U.S. in many ways. Um, nearly 88,000 people have died from alcohol-related causes annually, making it the fourth leading uh, preventable cause of death in the U.S. And it costs a staggering amount of money. Um, in many ways, uh, there's direct cost, like hospital cost and treatment cost, but there's indirect cost, like um, days loss of productivity because someone was hangover to um, someone that died early in a car accident to a drunk driver. So there's a lot of direct and indirect costs that are due to alcohol and that are um, really a problem, honestly, for, for the United States and worldwide. If we can move to the next slide. Uh, so these are the costs in the US. Um, most of it is cost is paid by the government. So, so Medicare and Medicaid type of payments. Um, binge drinking is a big part of this. And I have to say binge drinking and college drinking is a very important part of this illness. Uh, underage drinking is a very important part of this illness. People are starting to drink very early. And um, um, drinking while pregnant, which, um, you know, I, I, I always say this, it's incredible that we're still talking about this. It, it, it is an illness, it is a problem, and there's still a lot of um, costs that are related to drinking while pregnant. Uh, if we can move to the next one, please. So this is how we measure drinking. Um, when I'm going to tell you now what's good and bad drinking about a can of beer, a 12 ounce can of regular beer, which is about four or five percent alcohol is one drink. The equivalent of that on wine is a five ounce um, um, table wine, um, um, about 12 percent alcohol or 1.5 ounces of distilled spirits. So if you're drinking something like rum or tequila, it's just a very small shot, a 1.5 ounce. And, um, and in the US, if we can move to the next one, um, um, 
what we consider risky drinking, and by risky drinking, these are the levels that are associated with illnesses. These are the levels that start changing how your brain functions, and these are the levels that will start causing illnesses in your liver, your pancreas, your heart, and uh, like your overall health. Um, men that drink more than four drinks on a single occasion, so in one sitting, or 14 drinks per week, which would be having two glasses of wine every day, um, that puts you at risk of drinking. Uh, for women, it's three drinks on a single occasion or one drink uh, daily, so seven drinks a week. Um, so there's a link actually for our website on rethinking your drinking if anyone wants to go in there and look at uh, their own drinking. If we can move to the next one. Uh, binge drinking is drinking five or more drinks on one occasion. Uh, I think everyone you know, knows what is binge drinking, um, but uh, it's getting to a breath alcohol level of 0 0.08 grams per deciliter within two hours of drinking. So if you're drinking fast, if you're drinking several drinks in one sitting, um, that would be considered binge drinking. And um, heavy drinkers, people that have, um, that are very likely to develop dependence and more severe problems with alcohol use disorders are people that are drinking five or more drinks in the same occasion on at least five days in 30 days. So if someone is kind of having um, drinking episodes on weekends, that will probably get you into the heavy drinking category very easily. Um, if we can move to the next one. And so why do we care so much about binge, binge drinking if this is something that you might do just once a year, as opposed to something that you do routinely? So there's whole type of very difficult behaviors that are fairly common um, on binge drinking that people will not have if they're not binge drinking. So if you look at this, um, the, the, the frequency of this behavior, so for example, someone that is injured in a suicide attempt, uh, it's more likely to happen after a binge drinking episode, injuring in a fight, um, having problems at school or with your performance, um, becoming pregnant or having gotten pregnant, carrying a gun, use of marijuana, or driving with someone that is intoxicated. Um, this is much more common on people that binge drink than people that abstain from alcohol. Um, and just to, to speak a little bit of when drinking becomes a disease. So what is an alcohol use disorder and what are the, the problems with alcohol use disorder? So the typical signs of alcohol use disorder, um, uh, craving of course, so thinking about alcohol and wanting to drink, loss of control, and this is very important. It's being unable to stop once you start drinking or uh, drinking more than you're planning to drink, uh, spending most of your drinking time um, and giving up important activities. So if you, you know, decide to go and drink and, you know, don't meet a deadline or have, uh, avoid your friends because you're drinking or avoid your family because you're drinking, this is, this is, these are some of the symptoms. Um, continuing to drink despite problems. So if people are telling you you're drinking too much and you're kind of not hearing this or you are getting in trouble with school and you're still drinking. Um, of course, developing a tolerance, so needing to drink more alcohol to get the effect that you initially had, and withdrawal, which is feeling sick when you're not drinking. So, so if you're feeling, um, um, you know, shaky, if you're nausea, sweating, um, when you stop drinking, uh, not not hangover is different than hangover. Uh, this is kind of feeling more shaky. Um, can we move to the next one? And, and this is kind of the, the progression on, on alcohol use disorders. So there's initially kind of a more impulsive stage in drinking, which is the binge drinking. So, you know, when someone starts using, they kind of have initially some pleasurable effects from the drinking. You can kind of plan a happy hour with friends and, and have a sober week, just thinking of, you know, your happy hour on Friday. Um, uh, you have an intoxication and you might have a hangover after that, but it's kind of impulsive drinking. If you continue to drink or you make your drinking more frequently to drinking daily, this will turn into compulsive drinking or a more compulsive stage of drinking where people actually need to um, uh, drink around the clock pretty much every day to make, make sure that they don't go into withdrawal because they have developed tolerance and they will feel very sick and they're really not in control of their drinking any longer. Uh, so this is a progression on alcohol use disorders. And as I said, your brain will change with your behavior and with what you're doing. 
your body will change with your behavior and what you're doing. So, so really, I think the key part on what we're saying is choose the behaviors that will help you change for the better, as opposed to using behaviors that initially might offer some reward, but that come with a very high cost. Um, and I think um, we can go to the next slide. Um, just wanted to say a couple of things about genetics of alcoholism, because this is important. Um, alcoholism is influenced by your genes. About uh, 50 to 60% of uh, the risk of becoming an alcoholic is inherited. Uh, half of the risk, uh, it's determined by your own decisions and actions. So um, even if you come from a family where there's a lot of alcoholism or where there is a lot of people that have problems with alcohol, um, you have a lot of control of this. You, you can really change your outcomes and you can really change your life by, by abstaining or staying away from alcohol or really being careful with your alcohol use. Um, so there's uh, a, an important part that is genetic and there's an important part that is determined by your own decisions and actions. We can move to the next one. Um, on, um, one of the things that I wanted to say about the, the medical part of alcohol use disorders is it's bad for your brain. It really shrinks areas of your brain that are very important for your functioning. Um, it, it, you know, what we see in my patients is the report always says that their brain is older than the stated age. So they look a little older um, on their brains. There's a lot of atrophy. Um, one of the areas that gets damaged is the frontal lobe that helps you plan, control your behavior, problem solve is related to mood. So there will be damages to your brain that you don't want. You don't want to be someone that is more impulsive, that is, um, that has mood problems or that has difficulties controlling their behavior. And uh, other than just the brain, uh, if we can move to the next slide, it causes a lot of damage to the rest of your body as well. So everyone knows about liver disease and cirrhosis, but it's also bad for your heart, despite all the things that tells you that a glass of wine is good for your heart. Um, it causes atrial fibrillation, it causes some forms of arrhythmias, uh, it causes um, blood pressure and heart rate changes. Um, there's pancreatitis. It, there's an increased risk of many cancers that are very well documented. Uh, so it's in many ways no different than tobacco that I think many people are more aware of tobacco than the risk on alcohol. And of course, uh, stomach ulcers and fetal alcohol syndrome. So, so alcohol is not a healthy behavior, no matter how euphoric or how helpful it can be during that initial drink is not the numbing behavior that you would want. And I'm gonna go back to Maureen, who wants to talk about coping now. Thank you, Nancy. That was it's really powerful information um, about alcoholism. We, you know, we talked globally about coping and numbing, and then we narrowed it to alcohol because it is, alcohol is really unique because it's a drug that is sort of celebrated culturally, right? Especially around the holidays. Again, that's sort of, it's another, it can be another major stressor, um, along with all the other holiday stressors at the time where alcohol is flowing and we use it in this way to celebrate and yet it can actually be a huge problem for so much of our society. So if you're hearing this information and you are feeling like you might have a problem and someone in your life might have a problem, we're gonna talk about that now. And I wanna start off by just saying, if you do feel like you have a problem with alcohol, you are not alone. There's approximately 14 million adults ages 18 and over had an alcohol use disorder um, in a study in 2019. So it's common, it, it happens a lot, and there are, routes to, there, there are routes to getting better. There are routes to getting sober. There are so many different ways, so many different routes to getting help because it really can, alcohol really can be a numbing behavior that leads to losing all important things in somebody's life. So you can start out by just seeing your physician, seeing a, there are mental health professionals who specialize or only work with addiction. There are so many routes to help. We wanted to include some websites that have lots and lots of resources. Some people choose to go for treatment. Some people choose to do outpatient treatment and some people choose to use anonymous 12-step support groups. Um, there are 12-step groups for alcohol and many other substances and they're in all parts of the world. 12-step programs are, are facing a unique time that I think has pros and cons 
the groups are available all over the world for free, no cost, no commitment. And now most of them are not in person, but are over Zoom, but they're still available all over the world. So the benefit of that is that you could potentially go into a support group um, from your home to any different part of the country or world, they're in many different languages, and you can meet with people like you. There are uh, LGBTQ support groups for 12 step, and there are different ways to find people like you who are struggling with what you're struggling with, who want to find ways to get better. So there is hope. This is more resources that we wanted to provide for you. These are government agencies, nonprofits and apps that have, like I said, tons of different resources, 12-step programs, ways to help guide you in determining where to go for recovery or treatment for rehabilitation centers. And, and there's, there's just, there's a lot of information out there for people to access. So talking a little bit about coping with a loved one's addiction. Um, because again, if that's something that you're struggling with in your life, it is likely to be a stronger issue in December when you're gathering with people, if you, if you are gathering with loved ones and really anytime, but these are some steps that you can take to sort of cope with a loved one's addiction because addiction affects the whole family. It affects the entire community if somebody's struggling. The first thing you can do is set boundaries. Boundaries are lines that you draw around your life and ways that you protect yourself from your loved one's addiction. So know that you can plan if you're going to family events and parties and get together this holiday season where you anticipate or fear that a loved one might be intoxicated, you can leave early. You do not have to subject yourself to being around someone who's intoxicated. It's much harder to change their behavior at the time than it is to change your own behavior. But so you can, you can say, you know, I can't get this person to stop drinking, but I know that they're likely to be drinking heavily on this particular holiday. So I can make a plan to sort of leave early. And those boundaries are really hard to draw and they take a lot of time and practice, but they can really help. Um, the next step is do not take responsibility. So, you know, you did not cause your loved one's addiction, no matter what sort of a common, a common line that people who are familiar with loved ones struggling with addiction will hear is, if I didn't have this going on, I wouldn't, or, you know, a litany of excuses. But the, the truth is that people are overwhelmed by their disease. They're overwhelmed by a compulsion to continue to drink or use, and it is, it is not your fault or really within your control. So you cannot affect whether or not a person chooses to get help in your life but you can make choices that make it harder for them to continue to use, or you can make choices that make it easier for them to use. And that's where we talk about the boundaries. You can leave early. You can decide what you will and will not tolerate. That's the part that you can control. So that's what you kind of want to focus on in the short term. And now the next step is consequences. And this is when we get into the idea of enabling. I, enabling really is helping the addict in your life manage the negative consequences of their disease without managing the disease. So if you are cleaning up the mess for a loved one or a colleague or a person in your life who is struggling with an addiction, then you might be enabling them. If you are covering up for them, lying for them, giving them money that you suspect is going to alcohol or drugs, then you are probably enabling the addiction. So like I said, you can control your behaviors. You ultimately cannot choose if someone decides to get help, but think about what you can control. You can control how much you're willing to give to someone's addiction and when you are willing to say, no, this is not something that I'm gonna to tolerate. Um, Line with that, Al-Anon is a 12-step program that's free and anonymous. And, and this is a group designed to help people who have a loved one who is an addict, who are not necessarily addicts, themselves, but who are struggling with someone in their life who is, because it's so damaging and costly. So if you want to talk with a loved one about their addiction, this can be a really difficult thing to manage, but there's some tips and tricks that can make it 
a little bit easier and can uh, help potentially make it a more productive conversation. Do not attempt to have a conversation with a loved one or colleague while they are intoxicated. It, it, for some people, feels like the obvious time to talk about it when they're intoxicated. It also might be the time when you are the most emotional and frustrated with this person, but it's not likely to yield benefits to talk to someone while they are intoxicated. The next step is to pre prepare for some defensiveness. This is a topic that most addicts who are struggling have some level, whether it's conscious or not, of shame, guilt, and remorse, and struggle. So they oftentimes will project defensiveness to try to protect themselves, again, from the pain that they know their addiction is causing. And if you try to approach someone from a place of love and concern rather than judgment, you are likely to maybe reduce some of that defensiveness that people feel and therefore maybe help them to actually make a change. It feels so intensely personal, but as Nancy said, this is a disease, the addiction is a disease, and I like to think of it as something sort of outside the person controlling them. So thinking in terms of talking to the disease the person is struggling with, not necessarily talking to them. Because people will say, you know, if you loved me, that you wouldn't, you wouldn't drink and um and they really feel that way they feel like the addict doesn't love them and it's that's just not true the truth is it's outside of their control again which is why control is such an important point to pay attention to in terms of your own habits and again if you want to try to help someone to get help you can talk to them about you can give them specific resources which you can find on the slides previous Okay, so thinking as we wrap up today about how can you cope, how can you develop healthier coping habits? If you've watched this and you are thinking about some of the habits that you have in your life and you're thinking, I, I don't know how to change them, we have a lot of ideas for how you can actually change them. Once you're aware of your habits and you become more conscious of them, you can then move into the planning stage where you plan to make changes to your habits, but you have to be mindful of them to make that start. So what do you want to, what do you do if you want to say integrate exercise into your life and increase your toolbox of coping mechanisms? You can find healthier ways to make easy choices and remove temptations. You hear this a lot, I think, with food, you know, removing junk food, removing alcohol, removing these things so that you don't see them can be a good sort of first start. Um, all habits include a cue that triggers your brain. So even just seeing, you know, your running shoes out and trying to set up specific time to go running or to go walking, just seeing those sh shoes can be a reminder and setting yourself up for a success includes setting those cues. The next step I like to give people is to create accountability. This can be a really helpful tool we use to create new, healthier habits for ourselves. If you are struggling all on your own to create change, that can make it a lot more difficult, right? It's easier to let ourselves down than someone else oftentimes. So find people to help you with this. This is, this is why re research on 12-step programs that is limited but feels that it's fine that it's impactful it's because it's finding a group of people who have a shared cause and can help keep each other accountable you can create that with so using social media using a workout partner and i tell people you know what even if you just do it virtually even if you just check in and i've had people say that they put they log into zoom with a coworker to just sort of or facetime with each other while they work just to help keep each other accountable and that can be helpful so bring people into your life to help you the next step is to collect data on your progress collect data on yourself try to jot down how things are going for whatever habit that you're trying to work on if you do that you can find interesting trends and patterns in your habits and that can really inform when you're most likely to give in to a habit that you're trying to change, when you're most likely to be successful changing a habit, and you can learn a lot from that data.
So another, another um, tool you can use is imagining the future. It, usually creating habit change is very difficult in the short term and uncomfortable and usually has some long-term benefit that we're hoping to achieve. So envision that, visualize and think about the long-term goal over the short-term discomfort. Write it down, write it down on a post, post it, you know, and put it around your house. Give yourself those visual cues of what am I doing this for? What is this short-term discomfort gonna gain for me in the long-term if I stick with it and create this habit change? There's, it's often quoted the idea of the 21 days to change a habit, but really research shows it depends on the habit and it can take much longer or sometimes shorter than 21 days to really change a habit. But that the longer you continue to persist, the easier it becomes to engage in that new habit. So reward yourself when you find success at changing a habit. Um, before something becomes intrinsically rewarding or just sort of rewarding for the, the natural benefit that it gives you of feeling healthy, it sometimes needs to be extrinsically rewarding. So there's nothing wrong with giving yourself small rewards when you achieve small goals. It's also creating a behavior loop of positivity. And then maybe most importantly, be patient. Be patient on yourself and remember that, that these things take time, setbacks happen. That's a really important part of changing habits is, is that most people will fall down and stumble many, many times. If someone is struggling with addiction, um, they, will, they will know that relapse is a really important and unfortunately normal part of changing a habit. Try not to let that set you back or get you, you know, have you give up because it usually takes much, a lot of time and a lot of efforts and a lot of starts and stops. And I tell people, use that falling down as data on yourself and figure out what happened, what went wrong, and what can I do differently next time to achieve the goal I want to achieve. So when you're looking at setting a goal for yourself on making a change or creating and developing a healthy habit, a good guideline is to create SMART goals. This is a good framework for thinking about it. So saying, I just wanna exercise more is not, a good, is not a good goal. A better goal would be, I want to walk five days a week for 30 minutes with this person, right? Try to make the goal specific and measurable so that you can document success and you can document stumbles and make it action oriented. So I want to be healthier, means a lot less than I want to, you know, eat, eat the, eat a salad five times a week or take a walk five times a week or meditate for this long specific action oriented habits combined to make you the person that you are. Be realistic, create a goal that's realistic and give yourself a time frame. So speaking on habit change again, willpower, common, common misconception on addiction is that the person is just lacking willpower. And the truth is that willpower, um, we have a very limited supply of willpower and it is really finite. So the only way to really set ourselves up for success on changing really deeply ingrained habits, particularly those that are, are really addictive like alcohol or drugs is to plan and prepare and expect willpower to be low and expect willpower to not work. You have to change your life and change the setting for yourself to be able to change your habits. So Sharon, I think we will maybe have time to open it up. Yeah, I just, uh, I actually started to say that, but I hadn't unmuted myself. So that's <laughs> a habit that I've struggled to break to talk against the uh, mute button. So um, I wanna thank uh, Nancy and Marin, and there are some questions. Um, and so we're gonna go ahead and hopefully um, between Nancy and Marin um, answer, um, answer them. So the first one is um, how can you address your enabler and or enablers? And I assume this is from, from the perspective of I'm struggling with something and and somebody else is enabling me in that and, and how do I 
work with them to um, address that? Um, I think that enablers, we usually serve, the best way to manage any of this is to try to focus, I think, again, on what we can control, which is ourselves, and expect there to be enablers and expect there to be roadblocks and things that get in the way. But you can also speak directly, I think, to an enabler who is maybe getting in the way of your goals. And you can try to communicate to them that it's not helpful. But at the end, I, in the end, I think you're better off to try to avoid the influence of the enablers. It might be easier than changing their behaviors. Unless they're really motivated to change their enabling behaviors, you're better off trying to avoid their influence. Yeah. Thank you. I have to say my experience with patients is usually when they say, um, you know, most people that are enabling a patient are trying to help them in a very misinformed way. Uh, when the patient makes it very clear, this is not helpful, you're actually hurting me with this behavior, most enablers will, will take a step back. So, so I think that is important is to let the people around you that you're, you know, depending on what, you're, what is your behavior, you're sober, sober you stop drinking, you, you are not using X or Y drug, you're not, you're trying to keep an eye on your gaming. Just let people around you know that you're taking a step back, that it's not a healthy behavior for you any longer. And, um, and usually enablers will, step, will take a step back as well when you're letting them know that it's no longer a helpful behavior for them to invite you to game or to invite you to drink or whatever it is that they are doing that enables you. Okay, thank you. Um, this has been upvoted a lot, um, and I could add my upvote here, um, and that is about resources specific to internet and smartphone addiction. And I um, will just, before I uh, ask Marin and, or Nancy to weigh in on their thoughts about this, say that the website on the resource slide, helpguide.org, has info dedicated to smartphone addiction. And so um, you'll want to go ahead and check out that resource. But just thoughts if uh, Marin or Nancy have any thoughts about addictions around technology and our phones and the internet. It's not really my area, but I have to say at this time where we're communicating through internet and where most of our interactions are through internet, I can see that this will be difficult. Um, I, I think you just need to be, um, look at the resources in the resource page, but I think you need to be very, um, you need to measure yourself. As I said, if your behavior is at some point being hurtful, if you're in a place where um, you're numbing yourself and you're not actually growing from your behavior, um, I will limit that, um, but there's a lot of resources um, on, on, on one of the slides for this information. Yeah, thank you. I would say a lot of people are, are struggling with this right now, and what I say to them is we can start with trying to moderate the behavior, right? And a lot of people have success with using goals to moderate internet time, uh, setting goals for themselves, setting there's ways to put controls on your devices to shut down over a certain amount of time. A lot of people have found that helpful. And I have talked to people who have found that just abstaining from particular websites is the, the best way for them to get healthy and get out of an addiction. It's very hard to do that for the internet, obviously, right? But you can do that for particular websites if you pay attention to which, which places on the internet are you really losing control over. Great, thank you. How do you cope with the guilt uh, that you have as you watch a loved one struggle with addiction? And how do you deal with the guilt that that puts on you? You know, um, how do you get out of the mindset, I need to help them, this could get worse, I really need to step in? That's such a good question and it's a very difficult question to answer. I'm gonna see what Maureen has to say because I think she works with this more than I do. but. You need to understand that they have an illness. It's not your fault or you're, you know, you're not guilty of them having an illness. Um, you're not responsible for their illness. Um, they, will leave, they will need, I'm sorry, your love and support uh, through the recovery process, but it's not your responsibility or it's not, it's not really on your hands um, uh, at that point. So, so I, I think it's very important that um, 
uh, that you, you feel your emotions, that you feel your, your, the guilt, but that you also understand that it, guilt is not the right emotion at that point because you're not responsible. You're not the person that caused the illness. It's not, um, it's not on you um, at this point, but I, I would love to hear what Marie, uh, Marine has to say. Yeah, I work with a lot of families and individuals struggling with an addicted loved one. And I think that it requires uh, a lot of reframing. So when you feel you're experiencing guilt, I think that what you are experiencing is a lot of profound sadness over watching the addict struggle with the consequences of their addiction, because that is painful to watch and that is sad. However, it is not, it's absolutely like Nancy said, not your, not your fault. In fact, ultimately you don't have control over it. You can move someone in the direction of hopefully seeking help and coming to terms with whether or not they choose to do that is a long process but it's just a constant reminder that, that those consequences you're seeing are the consequence of their disease, not of anything you've done. Thank you. Um, here's a question uh, directed at Marin about how somebody in the midst of a very busy day can find time uh, to just pause and reflect on how uh, their recovery is going, how their actions make them feel, that right now, given all the pandemic restrictions, there's plenty of time for that. But as your life is busy, how do you find time to sort of support your recovery? I think that you find time by reframing and remembering that nothing else in your day can exist without some basic um, healthy foundations in your life, right? And that I tell people all the time, taking time to work on yourself, pausing within your day to make sure you're supporting your own health is actually an investment in all those other things you do throughout the day. So your work, your relationships, your friendship, your, your relationship with your family, whatever it is, is all going to flow from that really important habit of maintaining your own sobriety and your own basic health. And that's why it's such an important investment of time. Thank you. Um, there's a question about wanting to understand a little bit sort of the, the neuroscience behind willpower and whether willpower changes before and after an established addiction. I, I have to say, I believe, as I said earlier today, that anything that you do um, routinely changes your brain. This applies for good and for bad. Um, when you, um, and this has been demonstrated uh, extensively, when you try to be positive or when you try to be grateful and you do that as part of your routine, when you do that, uh, you know, every day kind of as a scheduled task, it really changes your outlook. It really changes how your brain functions and you become more positive and grateful even when initially it was more of a task and more of an exercise than an actual um, emotion. Um, so, so your brain changes when you do something routinely. The, your, the wiring of your brain changes when you do something routinely. And this applies to willpower. So I think it's, you know, with AA and some of the support groups, uh, one of the things that um, patients hear all the time is fake it until you make it or one day at a time. And this kind of talks a little bit to this willpower, just do as far as you can do, you know, do it just one day at a time. And, um, and you know, fake that you are a sober person that never drank or whatever it is you need to fake. And you will become that person. Your brain will change into that direction. Um, so um, there, it, it is important, one of the slides uh, that Marine had was this, the, the slide on how far your willpower goes. If you are hungry, if you are tired, if you are stressed, there are situations where you need to know that you are very, you will be very easily triggered, and where you, where willpower will probably not be enough, where you'll need some extra support from family, friends, um, you know, a sponsor from AA or someone else, your therapist. But there's be going to be uh, times where um, willpower will not be enough, and you'll need to ask for help. Um, but that's at the beginning of the illness as you make this your new routine, you will change your brain and it will be much easier. It really becomes to some degree the new you. Thank you. 
Um, I wanted to end with one last question, but we're out of time and I think I'm gonna honor um, sort of the schedule. But I just want to say that um, this is our third webinar and in each of the webinars, somehow uh, we find a way towards the issue of perfectionism and that perfectionism is an unhealthy uh, addiction in science, which is, is how this uh, question um, uh, questioner framed it. And I guess I hope that we can take a little bit of time in the small groups today to talk about perfectionism. And I will take a look at the schedule and make sure that we do uh, a webinar and small group discussion on perfectionism at some point soon. I, I think the N of three um, is a message to me. One of the things that I am struggling with in terms of these webinars is the number of people who say I'm coming and I really want to come to the small group uh, when they register and then the number who come at the end. And I know that people get busy and we have many, many competing uh, things on our plate and we spend so much time on Zoom and it feels like, do I really want to go and be vulnerable and talk about these hard topics? But I hope you'll join us because um, you know, I think that the learning really happens from each other in the group. And I could see that already in the chat where people were putting in resources and support. The small groups are facilitated by a therapist from uh, the DMV area that we work with. They come enthusiastically because they find the scientific community uh, to be a community they enjoy engaging with. So um, please join. It, helps to turn on your camera, but if you're not comfortable doing that, no problem. Um, it certainly helps to participate and speak up. Like we like to say in the OITE, whoever does the work does the learning. Please remember that the stories and discussions are confidential. We are not taping anything during the small groups and uh, the facilitators will not remind you of that. If you're an extrovert, remember to step back and give others a chance to speak. And if you're an introvert, remember that it's hard to learn from you uh, and your ideas uh, unless you share them. And I hope that you'll join us in just a few minutes um, on the small groups. The meeting ID is 161-997-4331. The tape of this will be up on the YouTube channel in about 48 hours. We just have to go over the closed captioning um, and uh, uh, add um, uh, grammatical edits, and we will email out the slides. Let me thank one more time everyone for their really thoughtful questions, and Marin and Nancy for a lot of um, food for thought and uh, support and help in an important area. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.